thank you everybody. Um, today we'll talk a little bit about bed bugs, uh, a little bit basic biology and control, um, and also Happy New Year. Uh, this is our first of the year uh, for this uh, uh, True Champions uh, First Friday series. It's off to a uh, interesting start. Um, so again, hopefully we'll get more registrations come in, but again, Happy New Year, everybody, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so our agenda for today, we'll do a quick safety share, um, do a little bit on the bed bug market. Uh, some of that stats that are in here are, are a little bit dated. I tried to find some new updated ones, but couldn't find you know, a whole lot much further than right around 1920, uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, a little bit on bed bugs, you know, and, and why they're on the rise, uh, some of their uh, facts, descriptions, biology, a little bit on inspections, and then... Um, finish up with some control strategies and, and treatment options. So we'll go ahead and jump in uh, with the safety share. Uh, this is about, you know, when you're traveling, you know, be safe, you know, we're all on the road quite a bit. You know, I think over the holiday here, I think I drove about, I don't know, 2,800 miles, something like that. Made a trip from Florida up to New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, just visited some, some friends, and family. So be safe uh, when you drive. I love pictures. Um, so hopefully you didn't travel like this if you did over the uh, holiday. Uh, and then also, you know, just making sure anything on your vehicle is stacked or attached appropriately. Um, again, I just like pictures because they kind of give a, a story that can, can stick in your mind. These are just some photos I found uh, online and uh, just thought they got that point uh, across pretty well. So uh, moving on, uh, so bed bugs, um, you know, this was a 2019 uh, market um, report on, on bed bugs, you know, looking at, you know, how many companies out there are providing bed bug offerings, um, you know, where, you know, some of these numbers, um, you know, in different markets are, are increasing. And really the bottom line is that bed bugs do uh, or are kind of on, on the increase still. Um, I think there was a little bit of a lull you know, during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic years, uh, and I should say qualify that, you know, COVID is still here, but I think, you know, 2021 into 22, um, people weren't traveling as much. They weren't moving around as much. They weren't getting together as much. So the numbers, I think, went down a little bit. It'll be interesting to see if there is an update uh, that comes out. I, again, I just couldn't find one for that for those years. Uh, but I think they probably went down a little bit, um, but they are, uh, again, still a, a big factor. Um, as we saw in some of the headlines, you know, bed bug panic sweeps Paris uh, as infestations soar before the 2024 Olympics. This was back in October. Uh, this, these headlines kind of popped up all over the place. Um, so they're still out there. They're still uh, very prevalent and they're good for our industry, right? So, um, you know, these are things that we can treat, we can, uh, you know, include in our, our, our programs uh, and increase our revenues. So these are these are good things. 65% uh, of folks uh, do say that bed bugs are more significant source of revenue. Again, this was back in 19. Um, and I think that's still very, very true today. Um, you know, when I was out actually in the field doing pest control back in, let's say the mid 90s to uh, right up to around 2000, Never saw a bed bug. So definitely since uh, that time, the last 20 years or so, um, these guys have definitely become a major uh, a major pest that we deal with and uh, a really good source of revenue uh, for us. So good stuff. Um, you know, as far as treatments, you know, looking at a couple of things, um, you know, what are people doing for treatments? You know, what months of the year, if there's any that are different? Um, you know, and there were some differences noted. Um, you know, between summer, spring, uh, winter, fall, uh, and then looking at types of treatments uh, that were done out there, you know, are you doing insecticide treatments? Are you doing just heat? Are you doing fumigation? And I'd say about 95% of the respondents here are using some type of insecticide as a treatment. Um, I would say probably most are doing some kind of a combination, uh, whether that includes monitoring, uh, physical removal, such as vacuuming, um, you know, heat treatments are definitely something that I think has gotten more and more uh, prevalent. Uh, I think especially, you know, going throughout, again, the last 20 years, um, 
you know, initially those initial years, you know, it was pretty much all insecticide. Um, but I think the heat treatments and that equipment, you know, whether it's heat or steam has gotten a lot better. So I think there's been a rise in uh, those types of treatments and there are companies that that's all they do. So again, I think a combination approach is, is best. Um, you know, looking at callback rates for bed bug jobs, um, it's good to see this trend uh, that it, it was going down. Um, you know, I think it was around 5% in 2017, down to about 3.8% in 19. And I think these days it's probably even a little bit less than that. So I think those are, those are pretty good numbers and trending definitely in the right direction. Uh, Northeast uh, tends to be a, a hotspot as far as, you know, PMP is offering bed bug jobs. So, um, you know, about 76% uh, are doing some type of bed bug work there. So again, pretty prevalent up there. Uh, the Midwest, so Cincinnati, Kentucky, Michigan, uh, I would even say wider, wider than this. Um, geographically, there are resistant strains out there. Um, this slide again is a little bit dated, you know, it talks about urethra resistance, uh, but I'll show another slide I believe here uh, in, a, in, a, in a couple of minutes that shows it's not just pyrethroid, it's, it's other chemistries as well. Um, you know, they, it definitely, bed bugs definitely impact, you know, some of these worldwide events that happen. Um, you know, the Olympics back several years ago, and then we saw it again here with uh, the upcoming 2024 Olympics. Uh, anytime you have large groups of people getting together from, from all over the world, you tend to get uh, a potential increase in, um, in uh, bed bug activity. Uh, there's a lot of different regulations out there as well that have come up over the last few years. Um, I'm not going to go over all these, but there are local regulations. Um, you know, there's regulations on who has to pay for a bed bug job if it's an apartment situation. You know, some uh, localities uh, put it on the uh, tenant, some put it on the landlord, uh, or maybe some combination thereof. But uh, definitely a lot of uh, focus on bed bugs over the last you know, five years or so. So why are bed bugs on the rise? Um, greater human mobility, right? So we've been traveling a lot more uh, the last 15, 20 years, um, you know, and that's internationally. So a lot of movement, you know, from country to country, uh, less use of interior residual insecticides. So I think that, again, going back to my days uh, back in the uh, mid nineties, we used to always spray inside uh, on a monthly basis. So we would spray inside every every month. Uh, that has kind of gone away where indoor treatments uh, for general pest control are typically more as a as needed basis, mostly focusing on the outdoor or just doing maybe a little bit of a spot treatment on the inside. Um, also, the switch to baits for uh, roaches and, and, and ants uh, was, a, I think, another big factor where you're no longer you know, spraying large areas inside the structure. Um, for those pests, you're just putting out small amounts of baits, which, you know, aren't really going to impact bed bugs at all, where those residual sprays that were done years ago, if there are bed bugs there, you're definitely going to impact them. And then also, you know, many years ago, uh, again, back to my own situation, we just weren't familiar with them. They may have been there. We just may not have heard about them as much. Uh, and also the homeowner may not have known what they were. Um, you know, loss of, uh, again, DDT back early on. Uh, again, that was sprayed indoors quite a bit. And uh, with that disappearing and, and that type of treatment gone, again, bed bugs were allowed to, I think, expand a little bit more. And, you know, when you think about that, it's not just, don't think about U.S., think about other parts of the world where there was probably a lot more of this interior spray with DDT and other products, um, you know, for bed bugs. Um, let's see, let's move on here. Uh, so description real quick. Um, I think we all kind of know what a bed bug looks like, uh, these days, uh, years ago, I would have said, yeah, maybe not so much. Um, but these guys are, are fairly small. Um, uh, you know, there is kind of this thought out there, uh, the general public was that you really couldn't see them. Um, but they're very visible. Uh, they're about three sixteenth of an inch. Uh, oval, flat, reddish brown in color as adults. Uh, they are a true bug with a three segmented beak, four segmented antennae, 
uh, obviously six legs as well. Uh, they do have uh, large mandibles or mouth parts. They do have a thin uh, coat of fine golden hairs, uh, you know, shorter than their protruding eyes. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit here in a minute. Uh, they do give off a distinctive musty, sweet type odor when crushed. Um, males have a pointed abdomen, females the rounded abdomen. You can see the, um, the female there at the top, male at the bottom. Um, light brown or opaque in color. Uh, they do kind of, that color does change uh, when they feed. They get to a much darker color. Um, then they have a very squat or scrunched head. Um, I put a quick slide, a couple slides on bat bugs in here because bat bugs are something that I don't want to say we've seen more of, but I hear more about them. Um, so they're very, very similar to, to bed bugs. Um, they are parasites of bats. So if there are bats in a structure, um, there could be bat bugs there as well. Um, they will bite humans in the absence of their, their host, uh, which is the bats. Um, effective control of bat bugs, though, if you exclude the bats, um, or other, other alternative hosts, um, you can get some level of control. Uh, then you, you know, go ahead and you treat those harborage areas uh, as you would for bed bugs, and that should take care of the problem. Uh, they look very, very similar uh, to bed bugs, and really a, a microscope uh, is needed to tell them apart. And the way that you do that is uh, there's a fringe of hairs on the pronotum of the bat bug. Um, that are as long or longer than the width of the eye, uh, where when you look at a bed bug, those hairs on the pronotum are shorter uh, than the width of the eye. And you can see that kind of pointed out. Let's see if I can get my pointer to work here. Yep, you know, in this, this area here, uh, this fringe of hair is much longer in the bat bug versus the bed bug. And again, these hairs are longer than the width of the eye they're on the bed bug, no, typically they're not. So good luck with that one. Um, you know, if you have a good microscope, you can you can see the difference, but um, you know, just looking at them, you know, uh, with the naked eye, probably not gonna really be able to tell that difference there. So bed bugs, you know, they do feed uh, really only on blood of mammals or birds. Um, they attach their, their eggs to a surface in a harborage uh, where they kind of hide out in loose clusters or where they're placed in loose, cl loose clusters. They do have five uh, nymphal instars. Uh, you need a blood meal to molt through these different instar stages. Uh, life cycle could take four to five weeks in good conditions. So that's, you know, 75 to 80% relative humidity, 83 to 90 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, females can lay up to 500 eggs in their lifetime. Um, average hatch time, seven to eight days after being laid. And if you look at the eggs and they, if they have a, a small scarlet spot uh, within the egg, uh, that's pretty indicative that they're, they're gonna hatch. So they're, they're viable at that point. Uh, adults can survive a year or so without food, uh, nymphs three to four months. And uh, this is why monitoring is important. If you go out and do a job, you think you got all the bed bugs out of there, that would still monitor it for several months later. Uh, because again, uh, if they move back into some harborage areas, if the apartment or structure is vacant, um, they can kind of hang out there uh, for quite a while and, and still survive. And um, someone else moves in six months later, four months later, um, the infestation could all of a sudden be back again. Uh, as far as mating, uh, they do go through something or utilize something called traumatic insemination. This is basically where the males just find a female and basically uh, take their reproductive uh, parts and just jam it right through the abdomen of the female. Um, so it causes damage to the females. And as you can imagine, uh, they're not too happy about it and don't tend to uh, stay where there's a lot of males. So looking at the different uh, stages of a bed bug here, again, I think we've all probably seen these, but you've got your, your adult here, uh, female, um, you've got the eggs, first in star, second, third, fourth, fifth, uh, male down here. And these are very, very small. Um, when you try to find eggs, uh, the eggs are really, really tiny. And being that white in color, um, if they're attached to things like 
mattresses. Uh, most mattresses are kind of a white in color, so very, very hard to see. Uh, these first instars too tend to be a much whiter uh, color, but when they do feed, uh, they'll take on the color of, of, of blood really, so they'll get that reddish color as well. So really hard to, uh, to see the eggs, you know, inspection is, is very critical there. So a couple of uh, interesting facts that you know, we talked about, um, the females and, and the reproduction and how that can, can really damage the females, injure them. Um, so a couple of studies were done looking at, you know, the sex ratios of, of male and female in, in these populations. Um, so in small groups, uh, it can be pretty dynamic, even as the ratio in a larger population can be stable. Um, but as populations increase, uh, percentage of adult females grouped with other females also increases. And you can kind of imagine that, you know, the females are going to kind of stick together and maybe a little bit away uh, where the males are. Because again, they don't want to go through this traumatic dissemination process. So, um, you know, they don't want to be injured. They want to survive and uh, you'll be able to you know, reproduce somewhat more safely uh, uh, by moving you know, a little bit further away. Uh, and again, those females tend to kind of group together sometimes. Um, so, you know, the adult females, you know, we've heard, you know, from folks in the field that, you know, they tend to be off alone. Um, and again, I think it makes perfect sense just by the way that they reproduce. Um, other studies um, have shown that Females may not produce as much of this aggregation pheromone. Um, so what that allows them to do is, again, move away from those large populations where there may be lots of males. Um, and they can kind of go out on their own without attracting other bed bugs to, to follow them you know, wherever they're moving off to. Um, females, um, bed bugs are found away from aggregations most often in the field. Again, uh, kind of solidifies that story that, again, they don't want to be you know, hurt or damaged any further. So if you think about this, you know, who spreads the infestation? Um, she does. Again, just because she's trying to leave those areas where there's a lot of males and where she could be damaged uh, in that mating process. So I thought that was an interesting uh, couple of studies. Um, so, you know, bed bugs are, are, are known to harbor over 27 human pathogens. Um, but thankfully, um, they've really never been proven to transmit any human disease. So unlike a mosquito that bites you, uh, they can transmit you know, Zika, dengue, malaria. Um, we don't see that with bed bugs. So I think that's a really good thing. Um, obviously they can do some other things when they bite, but they're not really transmitting any of those uh, diseases. So. So that's a plus. So let's see if we get this to work. It's going to do it or not. Oh, it says I can't buy it. Um, so anyway, what this was going to be was a uh, just a quick little video of a uh, nymph uh, feeding. Fortunately, looks like it's not going to play for me today. Um, so, well, welcome to the new year, right? So, um, anyway, what you would see here, this guy, you know, pierces the skin, um, starts to take on that blood meal, turns basically a reddish in color, and probably fills up about 3x the size that you see there, maybe even a little bit more than that. Um, so, so kind of a neat little uh, video. This is available on, you know, I found it online. So, uh, I believe it's University of Kentucky is where this comes from. Um, but just a kind of a neat little um, video. So moving on to, um, you know, bite reactions and, um, you know, what you may see uh, if, a, if a customer says, hey, I'm getting bit, um, you know, they may see these little red dots. Um, they tend to be linear in groups. So if you could think about a person sitting uh, or actually laying on a, on a mattress at night, the edge of their skin is, is basically there's an edge where they touch the mattress and the bed bugs will kind of crawl up and kind of feed right along that, uh, their body and uh, the mattress where they intersect. And they kind of make these little lines of bites. Um, and they kind of, it can be a reddish in appearance. Um, you know, some folks really don't have any reaction at all. 
Uh, they can be itchy. Um, most times though, with the bites, there's usually not a reaction or at least even that itchy sensation for several hours, maybe even a day or so later, uh, which could make it kind of difficult for someone to figure out where they were, where they got bit, right? So, you know, were they traveling? Were they in a hotel Monday, a different one Tuesday, a different one Wednesday, and all of a sudden Thursday, they're having a little bit of a reaction or they see this reaction. Um, was it the first hotel, the second or the third? It may be very hard to tell that because again, there is a little bit of a delay in the reaction. And if you think about it, you know, that bed bug's biting you and feeding, it doesn't want to cause you pain or discomfort because what are you going to do? You're going to smack it. You're going to you know, go to that area, maybe scratch it, maybe kill the bed bug that's there. So it's a delayed reaction that usually happens. Um, so again, localized swelling, uh, reddening of the skin. Um, some people can't feel them at all, don't even know they were ever bit. Uh, there's no uh, center spot or halo like you do get fleas. Um, some people get a little bit of a blister there. Could be a small loss of skin. Uh, could be a large uh, well. Uh, could be itchy. Uh, you know, again, it could just be a little little uh, red mark as well. 70% uh, of people bitten do react to bed bugs. Reactions of people did not appear to differ by you know sex or ethnicity. So whether it was a male or female, whether you know different you know ethnic groups, um, it seemed to be pretty consistent across all those. Um, reactions uh, do appear to differ by age, though. So people 65 years and older tend to react much less to bed bug bites. And that's a little bit of an issue um, because, you know, if you've ever been into a senior living home or something like that where there are bed bugs, uh, they may not even know it. Uh, they may not feel the bites. They may not be even able to see the bed bugs um, as they get up there in age. Uh, I was at a site in New Jersey, gosh, probably 10 years ago now, where we were doing some trial work. And, you know, it was kind of sad, you know, there, there were residents there that were elderly. Nope, we don't have bed bugs. We, we don't have bed bugs at all. And this was one gentleman sitting in his, his favorite chair. And, you know, we could see on the floor a lot of cast skins from, from bed bugs from when they molted. And as he's telling me, no, we don't have bed bugs. I haven't seen any. There was a bed bug like crawling across his shoulders. So, again, um, it could be a problem in those situations where people just don't think they have them. They don't realize it. They don't react and they don't see them. Um, so, again, some, some pretty bad situations out there. And, people, and kind of the thought is that, you know, as we age, um, maybe have a less responsive immune system. Uh, they could also be taking certain medications that could diminish the uh, uh, response from the bite. Um, and then just again, uh, they may have diminished uh, capabilities, you know, vision may not be as good, so they may not even be able to see it. Um, but again, there are some, some reasonings there. So what I would say is, you know, if you're doing treatments in any kind of facilities like that, that house the elderly, you gotta be a lot more vigilant than maybe just ask those questions. Take a little bit better look around um, because again, they may not even know that they're being bit and they could have a serious issue. Um, let's see. So, um, you know, bed bugs are, are essentially nocturnal. So I think, you know, within the hours of probably about 1 to 2 a.m. and maybe 6 a.m. is probably when they're most active. Um, they do hide during the daytime and they hide in cracks and crevices. You know, it's not just around the mattress or the bed. It can be baseboards behind picture frames. It can be behind loose wallpaper. Um, Pretty much anywhere in that structure, uh, they can hide out. It's not just, again, that bed area. Um, takes about 10 minutes, uh, maximum 10 minutes or so to get a, get a blood meal. Um, they do prefer humans, but they will feed on other hosts as well. Uh, that could be pets, that could be birds and other, other animals. Uh, they travel 15 to 20 feet nightly to feed. Uh, they do feed every few days if a host is available. And really, carbon dioxide is the main. Uh, Q. So they'll follow that trail of carbon dioxide to the host. Uh, then they'll pick up on other semiochemicals that we give off, uh, such, you know, different body odors, things like that, to really hone in on where that host is. Find that meal. Um, you know, some other some other work uh, in the literature. And what I'll say too is, um, 
don't know if, if everyone on here is a uh, member of uh, ESA, Entomological Society of America. Uh, if not, I would highly recommend it. Um, you can go to, it's uh, ent, E-N-T-S-O-C dot O-R-G, so entsoc.org, uh, because they have a lot of good publications on there. They have about six or eight different journals that they publish uh, every year, and there's new editions every quarter, I believe. Uh, with all the recent data, you can search those journals really easily and find you know, just new studies on bed bugs or really just any other pests that are out there. So it's, it's a really good resource for you. Um, but what they found was that uh, well recent fed bed bugs take longer to kill than those have not fed recently. Uh, again, so kind of interesting. So if there's constantly a host there, it may take a little bit longer to gain control. If it was an empty apartment, someone just moved out weeks ago, um, you know, they're not going to be that well fed, so they may be able to get control a little quicker. Uh, so where, where are we finding bed bugs? Um, you know, that story about uh, Paris, uh, that headline was talking about people in buses looking on the seats in the buses and seeing bed bugs crawling on the seats. Um, but basically, they've been reported just about everywhere. You know, I'm not going to read over all these, but anywhere that you can go, um, you know, there's ride shares, the taxis, the buses, trains, um, you know, all those different uh, locations uh, are potential areas for bed bugs to be found. Um, so simply just about everywhere. You know, it's kind of the bottom line. So anything could be a possible infestation site. So inspections, you know, they're, they're pretty critical, um, you know, thorough and detailed, uh, you know, look at those cracks and crevices, you know, look around, you know, the bed frame, look around anywhere that the person or the occupant of that structure is spending their most of their time. So if, you know, obviously bed area, but if they have a favorite chair that they sit in, you know, definitely check that out. Um, you know, think corners and tight spots. They do like to have their body parts touching two different surfaces. Um, so again, look at those tight areas. Um, you know, they do prefer, you know, wood over metal type surfaces, um, which I find kind of funny, but I'll show some pictures where maybe that's not so, so true. Um, put some monitors out as well. Um, you know, and again, I think some of the treatment methods that we use today, you know, if you're going to use heat, uh, heat up a room um, or a structure, uh, I don't want to say inspection is not quite as critical, but um, if you can heat that whole structure up uh, enough to uh, to kill the bed bugs and, and the eggs that are there, uh, maybe not as important, but still you want to do as thorough a job as you can. Um, you know, um, monitors are a really good thing as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about those, but, um, you know, leaving monitors after you do the job, uh, sometimes even before is a good idea because there could be some very small infestations you may not you know, be able to, to pick up on right away. Uh, and then also, you know, your bed bug dogs, uh, they're really good. Um, you know, several uh, folks out there are using them and they tend to, to pick up infestations very well. So this is a, a photo. Um, I've had for a long time, not sure exactly where it came from, but if you look at this and you, you say, you know, in that last slide, you know, some of the, the studies indicated that uh, bed bugs prefer wood over metal. Uh, if you look at this, you look at those screw heads, what do you see? Maybe not a whole lot right off the bat, but if you go in a little bit further and apologize for the blurriness there, but that screw head is full of um, bed bugs. Uh, I would say there's probably maybe 10 in there, maybe a few more. Um, so again, here they're kind of huddled in that little screw head that's you know, obviously metal uh, versus the wood. Um, pick up the box spring, look underneath of it. Um, hopefully you don't see a whole lot like this, but this is a pretty severe infestation. Um, lots of uh, different stages here, some cast scans. You see all the fecal spots there as well. <clears throat> Looking at the edges and tufts, that's where bed bugs do like to hang out. Um, you can see a bunch here as well. Um, you know, looking at, you know, long corners and seams where the carpets hit the, hit the edge of the uh, baseboard. Uh, very, very important areas to look at. You know, there's the heat register there as well. Again, think edges. They like to get under there. They like to have two sides of their body touching something. So uh, great areas to look. Um, this one I think is pretty, pretty interesting as well. 
Um, so a little bit of clutter here, you know, not, not terrible, but you want to be thorough on what you look at. Uh, there's a um, crescent wrench sitting here on this uh, cabinet. If you look into the end of it here, um, lots of bed bugs in there. And again, this is a metal object. So um, again, that, that study I talked about what they preferred. Yeah, maybe true in some cases, but definitely not all. So again, a lot of, uh, a lot of bed bugs in there. So you think about a hotel room, you know, where do you look? So I just kind of put that there. You look, you look everywhere, uh, right? So any kind of cracks or crevices, electronic equipment, uh, the bed, uh, your wallpaper is always a, an area that if there's a little loose edge on it, uh, they will definitely get behind there. The curtains, um, the drawers, you know, look pretty much everywhere. So this is kind of what we looked at in that hotel room. Again, not going to read this whole thing, but uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, you know, looking at, you know, uh, some options for some of those different cracks, crevices, you know, those types of areas, you know, where, where they can harbor, um, you know, seal some of those areas, right? So if there's a switch cover that's loose, you know, tighten it up, get it sealed close to the wall, you know, uh, silicone-based sealants are, are the best, uh, you know, Use your sticky monitors. Um, you know they can definitely show you if there's something going on there, um, but they're not always the best um, to tell you 100%. Um, there are other types of monitors. You know the climb ups, the there's traps, there's CO2 uh, monitors. Some use pheromones. But those are more your active monitors, or your passive, or more just like those climb ups you put underneath the, the feet of the bed, feet of the desk, those types of things. So control strategies, um, you know, customer assistance is, is somewhat important. Um, you know, bedding should be laundered in hot water uh, to remove any adults or eggs that may be attached. You dry it on you know, moderate to high heat for 15 to 30 minutes, that can be good. Uh, one to three treatments are standard, just depending on the severity of the infestation. Uh, treat the mattress seams and tufts uh, for the precise uh, application. Uh, I will say, look at your labels uh, for any product that you're going to use, because there are some differences on uh, how much of the mattress you can treat. Uh, so whether you can just do those tufts or you can do the whole mattress, um, you know, encasements are really good. So put a mattress encasement on, or if the mattress is just kind of like some of those pictures we saw, you may want to just have it thrown away uh, and disposed of properly. Uh, you know, vacuuming works very well. You know, any kind of infested furniture that you do remove, make sure you deface it or put bed bugs infested on it, something like that. Um, you know, avoid using highly repellent materials. I got to put a question mark there because uh, there was some new information out. Uh, I believe it was University of Kentucky uh, showed some work that they did uh, this, this past year at the uh, ESA conference um, where they showed that um, pyrethroids were not repellent to bed bugs. So that's probably contrary to some of the things you've heard in the past. Um, but I would say to me, really not, not that surprising. Um, but what they do is they do a chamber that they treat two sides of the chamber. They take uh, time-lapse photography, looking at where the bed bugs went in that chamber, whether they stayed on the untreated side or really went back and forth. And um, basically it's shown that, you know, again, they, they weren't repelled. I can't remember the exact pyrethroid that they used. I'd have to go back and look, but um, again, showed that you know, some of these pyrethroids, they're, they're not repelling bed bugs off of those treated surfaces. Um, let's see, let's move on a little bit. So again, when you talk about, you know, defacing some of the stuff that you throw out, uh, this is a pretty cool sign I saw, I saw in a dumpster at an apartment complex, uh, which pretty much says anything discarded in here Furniture may have bed bugs. So it could be as easy as that. You don't want somebody throwing something out and someone else puts it in the apartment next door. Uh, that's just not going to help. So chemical options, you know, there's a lot of different things out there. Um, transport, uh, B4s, tempered, phantom, bedlam, suspend, apprehend, you know. So there's a lot of different products uh, available for bed bugs. Um, I think if you look at, you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of them are, pyrethroid based um, you have some combination products here which are uh, pretty much a pyrethroid and a, and a neonic 
Um, you've got clofenapir, which is a different mode of action as well. Um, then you have something like apprehend, uh, which is a biological, uh, it's actually a, a, a fungal uh, material. Um, so again, there, there are some options. Uh, I would say, make sure you rotate um, anytime you treat. You know, don't do things like this though. Uh, this is a bed bug treatment uh, years ago, uh, back in early part of the century, where they would just use DDT uh, dust and just bump it in the kids' clothing and uh, let them go off to school or wherever they're going. Um, but if you look at you know some of the different products that were available, uh, DDT um, and looking at um, you know some of the uh, uh, resistance that's been, been noted out there. Um, basically back from 1948, really up to present day, uh, all of these different classes have seen some type of resistance uh, uh, in bed bugs. So again, it's all of these classes basically that we have. Um, I would say the Apprehend product, which is again a spore, fungal spore. Um, haven't seen anything like that yet, um, but bed bugs do have defenses to um, pathogens that try to attack them. They actually give off a chemical that um, protects them. Uh, if you think about it, just in, in the natural environment that they're in, there's tons of fungal spores out there and pathogens that would want to attack them. So um, they do have some defenses for it, um, but uh, in high enough numbers, uh, those spores can definitely attack and, and do pretty well on, on bed bugs. So that product does work well. Um, it has some limitations on where you can apply it uh, as well. So it's kind of more those crack and crevice areas and then bed bugs do kind of go through that and hopefully we'll pass those along and move those around in the population. But again, so pretty much all of these chemistries, you know, do show some resistance, uh, which is why it's really important to make sure you rotate chemistries. And by rotating chemistries, you know, it's not going from, from one pyrethroid to another, okay? It's going from a different class to a different class. I mean, one second, my phone is ringing here. All right. So anyway, um, so again, you want to if you go to um, Iraq, which is the Insecticide Resistance Action uh, Committee, uh, they have posters like this, which show you all the different chemistries, you know, what groups they fall into. Are they uh, group two or group one, a group three, a group four? Uh, so you want to rotate outside of the group, OK, uh, which is really, really important um, for resistance management. Um, some of the combination products, you know, they do have different groups already uh, in them. I would say with most pests, you, you, it's difficult for them to develop resistance to both uh, classes at the same time. So combination products, I think, are a really good option. Um, but still, you want to make sure you do rotate if you're uh, you know, going out and, and doing multiple treatments at a site. So again, here's some of those classes. So your pyrethroids are really in group three, neonics, uh, group four, four A. Um, and then chlorophenopia that falls in the 13. So there are different classes available. Uh, I would say make sure you do, again, rotate those uh, on a regular basis. Uh, some other you know, strategies, you know, obviously using heat uh, is another one that's, again, I think gotten a lot better here over the past you know, five to 10 years for sure. Uh, there's equipment out there that can heat up rooms very easily to that 130, 140 range. Um, there's also things that use cold. Um, you know, you have, you know, steam machines, things like that. Uh, insecticides, obviously, which we talked about. Um, and then there's, you know, monitoring uh, that can be done as well. Um, I put a question here on, on bed bug routes, but, you know, I think there's a possibility. Um, so it's not just a, a one and done or two and done. Um, I think with the monitoring that's out there these days, uh, certain hotels or, or other types of uh, establishments, you know, maybe maybe there's opportunity to do a bug, bed bug route. So you put monitors out, you're checking, you're you know, making sure that things aren't going to get out of control for those types of institutions. Um, steam, you know, I like, I like the steam products or the steam um, uh, strategy. I think it does very well. It kills eggs, it kills adults. Um, and some of these are actually steam slash vacuum, so they can suck up some of the uh, uh, bugs that are there as well. 
I think it works very, very well. The only issue is there's no residual with it, with it right? So you clean up what's there uh, that you can see that you can actually get a, a shot right on directly, um, but there's no residual left behind. So I think using some type of residual in those cracks and crevices, uh, it was a good, this is a good add-on for that. Um, so heat, again, uh, you can do the whole room. Um, there's no residual there either. So again, um, you know, maybe some crack and crevice with a residual product. Uh, there's heat chambers that you can build and heat those up. So you put articles in there, heat it up for a period of time. Again, a good part of a bed bug program. Uh, monitors, again, very good. Um, you know, they do tell you, you know, in some some ways what's going on. You know, if it's a very small infestation, it may be a little bit more difficult. Um, but these can definitely um, help you determine if you've gotten good control or not. Um, let's see, uh, to prep or not. So this was something that I, I found back several years ago. There was some research on, um, you know, we talk about, you know, if, there, if you go into a house or a structure or an apartment, it's very cluttered. There's lots of bed bugs. You know, do you have them clean that up before you go in and do your treatments? Um, I think initially we said, yeah, back years ago. Um, but this can actually disrupt the infestation. It can promote further dispersal of bed bugs. Um, and in this one study, this was um, 114 bed bug infested apartments at Rutgers University. Um, they solved 95% of them with no involvement by the tenant. So really no cleaning up of a lot of those you know, debris that was there. Um, and I think what, again, what it did was it kept the infestations where they are and didn't allow for you know, other spreading of that infestation throughout that structure. Uh, fumigation, um, you know, there's a couple of folks doing that. Um, again, it's very specialized. So, you know, you want to make sure you do have the right licensing and the right expertise to do that. Uh, again, there's no residual with fumigation. So it does kill everything, um, you know, all the life stages, um, but really no residual there. You know, someone may have a bag in their car, they bring in the structure, and then it could be possibly back again. So bottom line is to use a combination of tactics, rotate your chemistries, be thorough, um, be flexible, um, really charge for your expertise, right? Because your knowledge is what is going to get control out there. It's really not any one thing that you do. It's really that cumulative knowledge that you have. Um, and uh, that's really what's going to save the day. And with that, I think, um, I think I am done. Appreciate Brian, you know, again, for a really great topic and and uh, presentation on bed bugs and thank you ed for all your efforts today as well and uh hope everyone has a great start to the new year and we'll catch you in february at the next one thanks everybody. Weekend, everyone thank you all thanks